good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, your participation, and I hope uh, uh, to give you some information that will fit the topic that we're discussing today. Though I'm going to come at it from a little bit of a different perspective. We're going to be talking about the challenges facing uh, the handling of claims after Brexit. And in my mind, listening to the speakers this morning, uh, having realized what a big problem it's going to be, I just kept wondering, having a lot of policies and a lot of claims handled out of the London market or by the London market in all sorts of places around the world, why would it be any different after Brexit? Why would it be any different in Europe than it is in the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, or in Indonesia, for example. And that's really what I'm going to look at uh, during my presentation. I don't have a presentation. Uh, I don't have any topics uh, or any slides that have uh, material in them. All I have are some case studies of major and complex claims that have been handled by the London market in very remote locations around the world. At the end, I will come up with one case study that was handled in the UK on behalf of a Spanish insurer and a Spanish insured. And then I'm going to ask, why, was it, why is it going to be any different, really? And let the debate and the discussion carry on. Uh, to start with, I'll just give you a quick overview of who we are. C-Risk uh, Consulting is a forensic engineering firm we work very closely with insurers and loss adjusters around the world. Uh, we help them with uh, three services, really, or in three ways. One is forensic engineering, where we uh, conduct root cause investigations on their behalf or to help them out determine what exactly happened. Uh, we also help with claims consulting after we establish the cause and an insurer decides that this is something they would like to or will be covering, we help with the reinstatement options. What should be done about the loss? We do, in some locations, uh, do some risk assessment and risk engineering on behalf of insurers. Uh, it depends on where are these locations. It's, in most cases, very highly specialized properties like uh, chemical plants, uh, industrial plants, and uh, a lot of power stations and power transmission grids. Our topic is going to be the expert investigations and bridging the gap. Uh, I called it the regulations gap. It's not really regulations necessarily in regulations gap. It's more of insurance gap or uh, codes, standards, uh, methods, techniques for investigating losses across international borders and not just necessarily between the UK and Europe. I think the London market having done uh, such a good job managing uh, claims across the world, uh, the loss adjusters are or possess all the skills they need to carry on these investigations across Europe. Uh, there are going to be challenges, and we're going to look at these challenges and see what will they uh, translate into. Uh, to start with, um, we have, or we're going to look at, a steam turbine failure in a geothermal plant in Indonesia. Uh, this happened several years back, and there were a lot of challenges, uh, the least of which, which turned out to be one of the most complex challenges is actually the location where, the, where this loss occurred and access, gaining access to it. For those of you who uh, have dealt with or learned a little bit about geothermal power plants, it's using heat from the volcano on top, in a mountain to generate steam, to, to, to heat up the water, come up with the steam, and then uses that steam to turn a turbine. So you can imagine we have to have a volcano and we have to reach on top of that mountain or close to the top of that mountain so that we can build that plant. So anything that happens is going to happen in a very remote location where the challenge to get there is very, very significant. This is the view from on the way going up. It's a very, very beautiful countryside. 
Uh, it, it, you, you see things that are amazing. I generated, I think, on the way up the four-hour drive up to the station, I generated almost a thousand digital photos of just looking around outside the window and taking pictures. So it's, it's amazing. But it also meant that it's very susceptible to mudslides and landslides. This was one of them, where actually we had to stop, the vehicle had to stop at one point where you can see the picture on top, uh, and we had to carry our tools, our bags, everything, ferry across to the other side where you can see it down there, and eventually get another vehicle to take us and continue to the station. Uh, along the way, we had to walk along this edge of the road, which was very deep, uh, fall down the side of the mountain. We managed to do it. It's not that difficult. Uh, you, you can do that. It's inconvenient. We managed to do it. But when we got up there, up to the station, to take apart this turbine that failed, we had to bring in a crane to do the work. Get the crane across this. That is a challenge that had to be dealt with. A very, very heavy and large crane that needed to be carried across just so that we can uh, do the analysis and take things apart. So that's part of it. And believe it or not, we, it, it, it was done. It was done. However, it took quite a bit of, of uh, innovative solutions, let's call it, to, to, to reach that point. So this is, like I said, a power station. It uses the heat from the volcano to uh, turn water into steam, then uses that steam to run a turbine. What happened is in the afternoon, everything was working fine. The shift comes in at 3 o'clock. They check everything. No vibration, no noise. Everything is working very, very well. Uh, all of a sudden, 15 or 45 minutes later, the RPM or the speed of the turbine switches from 900 RPM to minus 900 RPM. So it switches in the other direction so significantly. Nobody knew what was going on. They ran around, tried to turn it off electronically or using the controls. It never turned off. So they went out and tried to turn it off using the valves, the mechanical valves, and they managed to turn it off. Or in the process of turning it off, all of a sudden, they heard a major noise. The operator walks up there. Before, Luckily for him, before he gets to the turbine floor, he saw the explosion, and I'll show you what, what the results are. But it was a significant explosion, and the, the entire steam turbine case broke, uh, broke apart, and uh, everything came off. This is the condition of the uh, station, or the location where the turbine was located. In this building, the turbine was located. Once it blew up, the case came off. And oil came off, hit some of the hot steam pipes, and a fire ensued. This was how badly damaged it was. So that guy was very, very lucky not to have reached the top of the building in time for the explosion when it happened. In fact, some of the blades that ejected off that steam turbine hit the plant and caused significant damage to everything else in the plant. So it was a very, very significant uh, problem. It's a very significant loss. Eventually, it had to be looked at. We had to do an investigation of what happened and how it happened. So the casing that covered the rotor of the, of the turbine was actually blown into pieces. So it wasn't there. It was blown into pieces, so we didn't have a problem trying to look at the turbine, at the rotor of the turbine. But we needed to take that turbine out and look at it. So we had the OEMs, we had the manufacturer representatives in place. We've done some testing on site while everything is in situ, looking at whatever happened and trying to uh, evaluate what exactly is the root cause of this problem. We didn't see any problem, really. We, everybody agreed there was an overspeed condition. So the turbine ran much faster than it needed to. 
Why did it jump from 900 to minus 900, which means 900 in the other direction? We couldn't understand. There had to be some sort of a control problem or a problem with the controls or the monitoring system. In any case, we had to test the brakes or the uh, uh, overspeed mechanism that prevented it really from causing these problems. And we couldn't find anything wrong with them. So we started removing the turbine. Uh, this is part of the uh, hardware that had to be used to remove this rotor out of place. And just think about trying to get all of that across that road after the mudslide or on the side of the mountain. So anyway, it took a while, a couple of months, and it, we did manage to remove that uh, turbine, the rotor, out of place. These were the blades that were in the last stage of the rotor that was damaged. These were found on the side of the mountain as far as one mile away from the station. This is how violent that explosion was and that overspeed condition was. We collected all of them. We had to collect all of them because you don't know which one is the one that started this whole mess, which one was the first one that broke out. And how did they fail and why did they fail? So we had to kind of collect these, put them into place, trying to reconstruct it to which one was in which position was an almost impossible. In fact, I would say it is impossible. But we were able to at least figure out that some of these went in certain places. And we were trying to figure out which one happened earlier. Because we had a theory that we were operating with that one of those came off first. It caused some sort of an imbalance. And then we had an overspeed condition. That overspeed condition, then the rest of them started ejecting one by one. And really, just like a cannon going off and breaking through the casing of the turbine. So anyway, we managed to collect as many as we could. Uh, it took some time, really, to try to collect these. And eventually, we managed to bring them to a laboratory in Germany to actually do some testing on them. The rotor was left in Indonesia. We took it to a shop, a, a repair shop for turbines, and we inspected it there. We saw some uh, corrosion, some pitting, um, which is not unexpected. You're dealing again with a steam turbine. So you have steel that being subjected to steam all the time. So you would expect to see some uh, pitting, some uh, corrosion. But then we looked a little bit closer. And I don't know if you can see this clearly. But these are the pins that held each blade to the rotor. So the blade will stand up tall about 70, 80 centimeters. And then it will have fingers that will go into the rotor. And then you will put a couple of pins through them to hold it into place. If you can look at this picture a little bit closer, you can see that the steel used, or the blade steel, has not corroded to the same level as the pins. That was the first sign that there was some sort of a problem with the material selection, or could be some sort of a problem with the material selection. Obviously, the inconsistency in corrosion was a very big problem that had to be looked at. And whether to start with, whether that had anything to do with causing the problem. Because it might just be, OK, so what? They are inconsistently corroded. Does that mean that they really have caused this situation or this loss? So that was part of the things that we looked at. And we uh, microscop uh, did some microscopic analysis to the pins. And sure enough, we found out that the pins, the diameter of the pins, have actually dropped. So now we have much smaller pins than they are intended to, to be. You can see the gap between the surrounding or the surrounding the pins and the actual blade. So that would actually cause the blade to be a little bit loose. 
and you can actually see how the blade, which is not firmly fitted to the rotor, can start spinning out of space and can start actually to be rocking into place. So now we needed to look a little bit closer at these blades and look a little bit at, at, at how they were all installed and how they were all connected. Now here is one of the challenges that we had to, to reach or we had to overcome. These blades were being operated or refurbished by a vendor or a company in Indonesia. They were very quick to offer doing the metallurgical analysis on the blades to try to find out what exactly happened. Now, because of the distance, obviously, we couldn't transfer the entire rotor over to Germany to do the analysis. However, at the same time, uh, we had to look at it, and we had to look at it independently. So that was part of some of the problems that we had to deal with, is who has custody of that very crucial piece of evidence, who needs to work with it, how do we uh, manage the process of working uh, the analysis without really uh, upsetting anyone from a cultural perspective or from a business perspective, because they really needed that vendor to stay happy being a supplier to the power station. So these kind of conditions, these are not regulation type of gaps. These are not code or standard type of uh, problems. But they are problems never, nonetheless, because they have to be dealt with, they have to be managed, and they have to be taken into consideration when you're dealing with all the different aspects. Now, the lab, without boring you with all the technical and engineering testing that was done, the lab did quite a bit of testing on the fragments or some of the fragments from the blades. And we did some electron microscopy on the material itself. And eventually, we came up with what exactly happened. We found out that the last time the uh, turbine was refurbished, the vendor has used high strength steel pins because they are going to be under a lot of pressure and sustain a lot of stress from the operation and running at very high speeds. So they used very high strength steel. High strength steel combined with hydrogen in the steam. And where does hydrogen come from the steam? It's it's really steam that has gone through a volcano. It's water that has gone through a volcano full of sulfuric acid. So the high strength steel with the hydrogen, the high concentration of hydrogen in the steam, they led to a condition called hydrogen embrittlement. So that little pen became very brittled. It started corroding and corroding very aggressively and flaking off, so the size of it became a little bit closer or smaller. But that hydrogen embrittlement condition actually led to the pins becoming severely corroded and very, very brittle. Even though these pins were less than a year old, they were becoming extremely corroded and very brittled. This led to the blades start to loosen they started rocking into place. And there are a lot of pictures showing how they actually impacted the rotor. And as a result, they started rubbing against the case. Eventually, all it takes is one of these brittle pins to come loose or to break off. And as a result, all the other ones that have been stressing so severely over a period of time now are ready to come off, and the entire thing came off and, and actually ejected. So that was the problem. In the challenges that we had to deal with, coming back to our topic of today, uh, a lot of these challenges that we dealt with and the loss adjusters have dealt with, very successfully managed, uh, were overcome. There wasn't any problem. Yes, it took some time. It took some innovation, and that's the, the, the word that I will continue to use, because there was nothing before. There was no manual that told the loss adjuster 
how to manage the process. Uh, but they managed it, they dealt with it, and they came up with a very good outcome. We were very exact at realizing what was the problem, what they needed to do to prevent it from happening again. If some of you are, are wondering why didn't the blades corrode, because when the blades were replaced, they were replaced with a different type of steel, because they came from the Italian manufacturer who knew that when you put these blades in a geothermal plant, you have to use a different type of steel that does not corrode with hydrogen steam, or steam that is highly with hydrogen concentration. So, but the pins came off the shelf from the vendor in Indonesia who was responsible for actually doing the work. So there's that problem in place. Uh, the expert problem or the expert challenge had to do with quite a bit of the testing that was being done, quite a bit of the interviews, getting and extracting information from the people on site. Uh, there was a lot of insurance questions in place. There was a, a, an exclusion for negligence, whether the owner of the plant actually knew how to operate it and whether they have taken enough uh, precautions to prevent something like this from happening. So there was a lot of uh, questions that were asked and there was a very good outcome out of the entire process. Would, and this is a question that I will throw out there for later debate, would the outcome be, or the, uh, would the outcome be any different if this loss was in Europe? I don't think so. I think, I think the same challenges, even if the same challenges have existed, though I don't think that we're going to come across these type of challenges, but even if the same challenges have existed in Europe after Brexit, I don't think the outcome will be any different, simply because the loss adjusters have already developed these significant skills ready to manage it and deal with it. This is one that is very, it's, it's still ongoing, it's very, very uh, peculiar because it happens in a war-torn country, a country that has a lot of war. Uh, the, the challenges are a lot different in this case. This is a contamination damage to IT equipment and how to come up with a reinstatement option. And this is where <coughs> regulations might come in and become an issue that have to be done. Not insurance regulations, but believe it or not, maybe immigration laws uh, restricting certain people from coming into the country or leaving the country. So this was a fire in an IT center, uh, in the battery room of an IT center, really. It's not that uh, typical, but it's not that unheard of. It happens, and it happens quite a bit, where you have your backup battery banks uh, go through a problem, and eventually what we call a thermal runaway situation develops, and one of these batteries uh, starts on fire, and eventually the entire plant or the entire room starts on fire. So this was a fire. They heard a loud bang. These were the batteries going off and starting to burn. Uh, and then smoke started coming out of that room. Because of where this is located, it wasn't really that much of a uh, highly advanced location. So there wasn't a lot of experience for people to know how to isolate IT rooms from the rest of the facility. So this is the IT room, which was full of equipment to the tune of about $85 million dollars of IT equipment and the fire happened in the upper right or left corner of the room where is that battery room and because there are cables connecting the battery room with the IT room there was access points and through these access points smoke came through and contaminated the entire IT room. Again 85 million dollars worth of equipment that was equipment that had to stay on all the time because it was the backbone of the phone uh, network in the country. So you couldn't just turn it off because there was a fire. So it had to stay on. Uh, they did go off for about 12 hours or so, but it had to stay on and it had to be dealt with. 
Now, that is the access point from, of the cables, where the cables came into the room. And as you can see, that's where all the smoke from the fire room came into the room. And as a result, it affected all the equipment. The equipment continued to operate, still powered on, had to be left powered on. Uh, it went off, like I said, for about 12 hours, but then they had to power it back on and get it to work again uh, because the network, the phone network in the country, went down. When we started looking a little bit closer at the equipment, you can see all the smoke that was sucked in by the different modules and the different equipment into the different equipment, into the different modules, the different switches inside that room, in all the cabinets. You can see how much smoke actually showed up in a very funny way right across the vent openings of all the equipment. When we looked a little bit closer, a lot of the modules and a lot of the uh, different cabinets and a lot of the different equipment, you can see the smoke that was taken in. And when we opened the equipment and looked at it internally, we also found quite a bit of smoke in place. How did the smoke get in? Well, the IT room had to be cooled at a certain temperature all the time. So these were HVAC units that taken in all the air in the room, cooled it down, filtered it, and pushed it through the room again. And when that air has quite a bit of smoke, it actually pushed the smoke and circulated it. Not only through the room, if you look here, it actually, the smoke would be lingering at the top of the room. However, as the air conditioning units, the AC units were uh, removing or sucking in, really, the air and pushing it through the equipment, all the smoke particles had to be or were was pushed through the equipment as well. So we had quite a bit of smoke on the equipment. Uh, without going into too much technical detail, smoke can be very, very hazardous uh, and cause quite a bit of damage to electronic equipment. First of all, it will blanket all the components and prevent it from dissipating heat. It can actually cause electrical shorting across leads of different equipment. It will cause discoloration and very strong odors. Overheating and corrosion, which happens in the presence of just normal humidity in the air, were identified as the biggest problems, very catastrophic. And the likelihood of those happening was very, very high as well and had to be dealt with, had to be looked at, and had to be actually considered. So there was quite a bit of risk of damage to the equipment. Now, I'll, I'll remind you again, the equipment is about $85 million worth of equipment. There's about $85 million at stake over there. But more importantly, there is a network, or this equipment is used to power up a phone network in an entire country. Losing that equipment and losing that system, powering it down, would have cost the insurer about, these are names I'm not really uh, involved in, but I heard about three million a day, three million dollars a day or more. So there was a lot of interest in managing not only the property damage, the PD, after the loss, but also all the business interruption and also the contingency. How do you deal with it? How do you prevent it from getting actually damaged? And how do you make sure that it doesn't shut down on its own after being so damaged? So the first action was, please tell us what do we need to do to the equipment to make sure that it continues to operate while all the other insurance processes are taking place. One of the biggest problems was trying to get into the country. Again, that's a country that has very, uh, very difficult, let's call it, immigration procedure. Getting a visa to get into the country is not easy. It takes anywhere between three weeks and six weeks to get into the country. 
uh, you cannot, it is very unstable, and there are a lot of problems that have to be dealt with. So what do you do until you get the experts into place to do any of this work? So the first thing that jumps into everybody's mind, let the OEMs come in. They have local representatives. Let the OEMs all come in, look at the equipment, tell us what we need to do. They did. Their local representatives did. And they all issued the same form letter. I, I could swear they didn't talk to each other, but it was almost a form letter. We don't know what the impact is going to be. You better do something. What is that thing? Only one of them proposed something, which is if you buy an extended warranty from us, which will cover only a technical support hotline for you, it's not going to cover labor or parts, but for two and a half million you can buy that extra coverage so that you can actually uh, deal with the equipment if something happens. So there was quite a bit of problems in the first stages of the claim, which is the mitigation process. How do we prevent the damage from becoming worst? And that became a major challenge of how to deal with it. So you have to have, uh, we had to communicate by sending in messages, which sounded like very cryptic to the local operators, but we had to send them certain messages with certain explanations and certain diagrams and certain instructions, step-by-step -step instructions of what they need to do to manage these risks and deal with these risks. We did. They managed to do it correctly. They still missed few points. We told them that they had to isolate the rooms to prevent it from actually getting any humidity in there or further smoke or cross-contamination. Uh, they didn't think that that would mean the cable openings, which, had, which continued to provide uh, smoke into the room. There was quite a bit of problems in the mitigation. However, the mitigation actually was successful. It prevented further damage from happening. But then, we had to decide, OK, you can't run an IT room. You can't run the backbone of a phone system or a phone network based on some mitigation steps. You have to do something eventually. You have to come up with a reinstatement plan of what you really need to do. To do that, we had to go out there. We had to do some testing of the equipment. We had to do some chemical testing of the equipment. And while we were out there, we managed to also give them a lot of tips on the mitigation process. How do you control the heat? How do you control the humidity in the room? How do you ensure that none of the, dam none of the damage is going to happen? So we identified critical areas. These were listed in. Uh, if there is such a word, criticality of the equipment, how important they are to the network, as well as areas which are marked in red where we found the highest level of contamination. Not only the highest level of contamination, but the worst type of contamination, because smoke can have actually different impact on the equipment. So we had to look for certain contaminants and be able to say, this is where we find the highest level and the highest or the worst type of contamination within the room. That's where we need to deal with it. And based on that, we came up with the available options. There is replacement. You can replace all the equipment. Easiest? Not really. Not when you're dealing in that country, because getting equipment in and getting in professionals to install them was a nightmare. So it wasn't really the easiest, but it was an option. There is the restoration. Again, it became a nightmare finding somebody who can actually travel in there and do the restoration successfully. We ended up with an Australian team, actually, that knew how to do this and how to get into the country. Uh, the repair, and who does the repair? Is that something that has to be done locally, or is it something that has to be done outside? And a combination of all is an option. And really, uh, a combination of all is, is probably the way to go forward. But there was quite a bit of things that needed to be done all the way from the mitigation process, through the inspection, the damage assessment, the development of the reinstatement options, and then managing all the challenges.
Now, some may think that this is one of the worst uh, conditions and the toughest challenges faced, and I would qualify it as such, not, not maybe the toughest, but it is one of the toughest, really, to deal with. And I'm happy to say it's being managed very uh, successfully by a team of international, uh, mostly uh, from the UK, loss of justice. So again, is it going to be that difficult to deal with something like that if it happens in Europe? Could be. There are a lot of regulation issues that had to be dealt with. But I think there is that set of skills to deal with a lot of these challenges. Here is a warehouse fire. And in this case, there is a cultural challenge that takes place. When a fire happens here in the UK, the first thing we do, we pick up the phone, we call the fire brigade, and we say, hey, we've been appointed by the insurers. We would like to learn what you've seen, get information from you. And the worst case scenario, the worst of them would say, put it in writing, and I will release the report to you, and I will release any information that you need. Nothing more than that. It's very, very simple, straightforward process. We do it all the time. In this country, you can't do that. That is considered a security risk or a security situation. So you can't call the fire brigade that easily and say, hey, I've been appointed by insurers. The first thing they tell you is, so, who are you? And I had some of them yell at me and say, I don't care. You don't own the property. Therefore, I cannot talk to you about this property. You cannot. And I said, well, if the insurer pays for it, then really we are acting on behalf of who owns it. They said, not according to our law. You have nothing to do with it. You're not party of this fire. And therefore, we cannot tell you what we saw when we came out there and what we looked at. And that is a major challenge of dealing with it, because you would be investigating in the dark, and you can come up with some information or some conclusions, but that may not be what they have seen, or what they have learned, or what they have figured out. And as a result, eventually, you're going to contradict with them. And surprise, surprise, their courts or court system consider their report, no matter how poorly constructed it is, to be more superior to any other report, because it's an official party. It's somebody who has seen it or who has an official standing. So this was a major fire or a major warehouse with so many different uh, people in place. Most of them were uh, food products, dry and uh, not so dry food products. Uh, it was actually uh, being used very actively all the time because this warehouse kept all these food products that were sent in and out. And it was very, very close to a power station which stored fuel right by that warehouse. So all these round objects in the picture are actually fuel tanks very, very big, large fuel tanks. So when the fire happened, the fire brigade came out, and their main concern, they didn't really care at all about the warehouse and its contents. Their main concern was to make sure the fire does not spread to these fuel tanks, because it would have been a catastrophe. That is very smart. And that is something that is done all around the world. You have to assess the risk of fire spread, and you have to respond accordingly. You don't worry about the property. You worry about preventing it from causing further damage. And that's what was happening over here. But as a result, as a result the fire extended, or uh, the fire burned for about eight days because their job was to make sure it doesn't spread in one direction. They didn't really worry about the rest of the warehouse and what was in it. This is during the fire 
attack or fire protection, the action that they were actually doing. And you can see the warehouses already burned all the way down to the ground. However, there were still pockets of fire. In fact, when we went out there two weeks later, there was, we will go into an area and we will find that there were still flames burning in certain areas. We found the fire brigade uh, working at the time, and you can see the fuel tanks right in the back of the picture. So they did a good job making sure that it, does not, it did not spread. It did not go anywhere else. Internally, it burned all the way to the ground. Some warehouses were a lot worse than others, depending on what was in them. This warehouse had ice cream products. These were coolers that burned down, so they weren't that flammable, really. Whereas the one that burned the longest and burned the worst had vegetable oil. Cans and cans and cans, thousands of cans of vegetable oil, which once ignited, you, there's just very little you can do to put it out. So they managed to have it or to keep it away. One of the very interesting questions that came up during that is, the first question is obviously, what caused the fire? Can you tell us how it happened? Who's, to, who's at fault and so on? But a more important question was the policy warranty. Was there a fire protection system, a working fire protection system? Because that was part of the condition in the policy. You could have triggered the, uh, the, the entire claim and basically said, hey, your system was not operating properly. There was, there was uh, a fire protection system. There were pumps. The pumps were running and operating, and believe it or not, they were inspected just two weeks before this fire happened. They were all certified, both by the fire brigade and by a third party uh, contractor. So they were operation, they were operational. The sprinklers, we managed to actually determine that they did work. They went off. However, they went off for minutes. Rather than gousing or putting the fire out, they ran out of water. So there was a very good, very well-designed system. However, it wasn't really operating properly. And the reason is we discovered that there wasn't water in the tanks. The tanks didn't have enough water. Now, obviously, after the fire, the tanks would not have enough water because they should have been used, but we also determined that there wasn't enough water before the fire, and the reason was one of these, a little tiny pump that was sitting using the same water in the tank to wash cars by the night watchman. So he actually used the water available to wash cars at night, and the tanks were empty. Now that brings, of course, a question of why, weren't the, why wasn't that water re Re, you know, refilled because it should have been refilled. So that brings quite a bit of questions as far as what exactly happened in here and who is to blame and what exactly is the problem. Now, going back to the main challenge, which was working with the regular or the authorities in there. There were several experts involved in this case. And several of these experts showed up, did the inspection, called the local authorities. The local authorities told them, you're not involved. Sorry, move on. We can't talk to you. Okay. However, we managed to find a backdoor connection into the local authorities, somebody that we worked with on a different loss. And we called them up and we said, hey, we don't need anything from you but we have 500 pictures that we would like to show you. Do you mind if we come and share them with you? He was very happy and said, yeah, please, come on over. We went over there, introduced us to the officer who's in charge of the investigation, sat down, spent some time showing him the pictures, and then offered him to come on board or come on site with us so that we can explain to him what we're seeing and how we're interpreting it, which he found to be very, very uh, appealing. And actually not only agreed, but he ordered all the people in the fire brigade to cooperate. 
providing us, which is very important, was very important in this case, with video footage of them putting out the fire at the beginning, showing where the fire started, how it developed, how it spread, and where it went during the process, which was very critical to establishing the exact seat of the fire and establishing what exactly happened. So again, here's a challenge, being able to deal with a country which has different rules than us, a different way of dealing and managing fires than what we have over here. Sending them a written request like we do in the UK wasn't going to generate anything. However, being able to find these personal connections which we can leverage or use to gain access and collect information was very, very critical. And again, this is a very, very significant challenge. It was overcome by the excellent work of the law suggestors who were involved because they knew how to manage that cultural difference in managing and dealing with the, uh, with the claim. So I'm going to leave you with this last case, which is a UK fire involving a Spanish manufacturer with a UK plant selling to the UK. Now these guys, I, I don't know that they actually exist. Uh, they, they take all sorts of solvents and very, very volatile, very volatile chemicals. They take it f away from the market after it has been used and they clean it up and recycle it. So they take away all these volatile solvents, they clean them up, they purify them, do a very, very uh, advanced chemical process, clean them up, and then package them and sell them. And they don't sell them as pure solvents. They sell them as solvents within certain margin. They have the characteristics, the chemical characteristics, that can fit the purpose for whoever buys them. So they do this process, and then they sell it. One of the people they sold it to is a roofer, or a company that makes, mixes these solvents with butumin to make roofing products that they sell to contractors. Fire broke out, significant fire. There are a lot of pictures if you want to look online. There are significant fire. Uh, all the solvents were very highly volatile. They kept burning for a single, for, for a period of time. They had to evacuate the entire, to the entire town because of the toxic fumes that came out of it from the fire. So it was a very big fire. The fire ignited. We, we could record the timing because there were people, there were evidence of everything. Uh, about four minutes after the insured, that Spanish company, the chemical plant, have delivered products to this plant in IBC containers or IBC uh, tanks. So they delivered all these volatile products and as the driver was making his way out of the plant, he can actually see behind him an explosion happened and then this fire went on. There was severe injuries for some of the people in there and there was some significant problems in there. Of course, the HSE took lead on the investigation of what was exactly going on. The investigation went on, like I said, they had to evacuate the, time, the town and remove everything out of there. So what is the problem? Well, we have very highly volatile chemicals being stored and delivered in plastic IBC tanks. Is that allowed? Is that even allowed? Because there's something called the electrostatic charge that develops in these plastic containers whenever they are filled and emptied. So when you fill them and empty them, the liquid slushing in there will generate electrostatic discharge or electrostatic charge. If that electrostatic or static charge is discharged somehow, then you have a spark, you have very volatile fumes, you have a major fire. So is that allowed? Is this even allowed? 
Well, it depends on who you ask. So these are the remains of the IBCs. Were they the correct type of IBCs to be used? The manufacturer said, yes, I am allowed to use that. The owner of the place, the plant, said, no, you're not allowed to use that. And I have proof. How could they both be right? Well, one of them was actually citing the ADR, the European Regulation on Transportation of Hazardous Material. The other one was looking at the HSE, but the HSE did not really ban it 100%, but there was another organization, English organization, that basically said, you absolutely should never use IBCs to transport hazardous material. Now that might be more relevant to our discussion today, simply because who do you, who do you follow? And how quick do these rules have to go into effect or be pulled out of effect after Brexit. This was really the main issue that, ha that was being debated by the lawyers towards the end of the investigation. In the UK, the owner of the plant was cited, was found guilty by an HSE court, and was fined a significant amount of money for the injury that the employees sustained. But in the insurance perspective, was it something that you have to take into account? Or did they really follow the rules according to the European regulations? That's where I see quite a bit of problems, really. Not the uh, facing challenges that come out. Because I think law suggestors have developed over the years a lot of skills to deal with a lot of different challenges, many of which we're not going to ever face in Europe. However, the regulations which is in place now, and whether these are going to be adopted by the UK or not, or whether they will be pulled out and therefore no longer apply, and when will that happen, is going to be a big question that has to be addressed. Because a lot of these industries rely on either European codes or rely on normalized which is British codes that are based on European codes. They have adopted them into place. And I heard at the early stages of Brexit that, th that we might here in the UK just take on all the codes that we have been dealing with, the European codes, and adopt them as our own and just move on and not deal with the process of revising them and finding out how they will apply or not apply. Is that going to happen? Will any of these codes contradict with any of the UK codes that we have into place. So that's where I will leave it, unfortunately, uh, with a question rather than an answer. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.